In, in domestic affairs, libertarians, of course, believe uh, that the sole, or at least the primary purpose of government is to advance human liberty. And the state should interfere as little as possible uh, with an individual's ability to earn an honest living and to enjoy the fruits of his or her labor. Uh, a prudent and effective government possesses only a few uh, enumerated powers, and it derives those powers from the consent of the government. The same principles apply uh, when individuals turn their attention abroad. In foreign policy, libertarians believe that people should be free to buy and sell goods and services, study and travel, and otherwise interact with people from other lands and places unencumbered by the intrusions of government. Libertarians are skeptical of direct foreign assistance from one government to another and confident instead, more confident certainly, that the voluntary interactions between persons uh, are mar far more uh, conducive to economic prosperity, but just as important, more important even, it's a basic human right. I like to say that libertarian foreign policy therefore is confident and cosmopolitan. Uh, whereas others fear what might happen if government were smaller and less intrusive, libertarians believe that on balance less government is better government. But questions of war and peace, as Tom alluded, that though they're really only one aspect of foreign policy, uh, are arguably the most important part of foreign policy, beyond the trade and, and, the, and the like. And the question of when and whether to wage war abroad distinguishes libertarianism from other philosophies. And though few libertarians are doctrinaire pacifists, uh, libertarians have traditionally favored peace over war and have done so more consistently than progressives and conservatives and other uh, statists. Quote, individualism flourishes during peacetime, wrote Ronald Hamowy in the Encyclopedia of Libertarianism, but clashes with the collectivism, regimentation, and herd mentality that war fosters. And it seems particularly appropriate at this time and in this place to note that David Lloyd George, though not a libertarian, wrote in his memoirs that, quote, war has always been fatal to liberals. Wars impede the free movement of goods, capital, and labor that is essential to economic prosperity. Restrictions on such exchanges constitute an assault on fundamental individual rights. Progressives and conservatives have on occasion found it easier to institute such restrictions during times of war and sometimes even championed war as a means to privilege the state over the individual. And I think for the most part libertarians are wise to these schemes. We see war as the largest and most far-reaching of all socialistic enterprises an engine of collectivization that undermines private enterprise, raises taxes, destroys wealth, and subjects all aspects of the economy to the meddling hands of bureaucrats and bean counters. In his magisterial survey, War and the Rise of the State, Bruce Porter, political scientist, summarizes the problem thusly. A government at war is a juggernaut of centralization determined to crush any internal opposition that impedes the mobilization of militarily vital resources. This centralizing tendency of war has made the rise of the state throughout much of history a disaster for human liberty and rights. And Tom stole my thunder a little bit. Of course, it was Adam Smith who taught that peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice were the essential ingredients of good government. Other classical liberals, Richard Cobden, John Stuart Mill, Ludwig von Mises, and Milton Friedman, for example, all excoriated war as inconsistent with prosperity and social progress and all saw its potential for growing the state at the expense of the individual. But a year before his death, Milton Friedman uh, evoked a familiar warning. War is a friend of the state. In time of war, government will take powers and do things that it would not ordinarily do. And I don't think I need to cite all the cases where this is true. One of my favorite examples is New York City rent controls, which were instituted in 1943 and remain in effect. Another classic case is a uh, little tax that was imposed on long distance phone calls in the United States, instituted in 1898 to pay for the Spanish-American War and remained in effect for over a hundred years. The war, of course, lasted six months. Um, so I don't really think I need to go into all the cases, and you all probably know some uh, instances of your own from, from the British experience. But if war is harmful to liberty, preparing for war to deter or prevent war could be said to be serving the interests of liberty 
or at least consistent with libertarian philosophy. And on the political right, uh, and even among some libertarians, uh, individuals who typically rail against the state and who complain about excessive spending believe that military spending is in a special category. Uh, a recent article said somewhat uh, cheekily, uh, conservatives see the military as an honorary member of the private sector. Okay. Because defense is a core function of government, perhaps the only essential function of government, or one of them, it would be a mistake, I think, to treat uh, military spending on the same level, level as farm subsidies or public housing or Obamacare, uh, you know it is NIA, right? Hopefully we won't come there. It would be a mistake to lump defense spending with other government spending. The trouble is, and here's where I shift from being a libertarian to being an American libertarian, the trouble is that most of what Americans spend on our military isn't intended for our defense. It is intended for the defense of others. This is not a controversial or novel thesis, I hope. The US military is said to be the policeman for the world, and many people appreciate that fact. They embrace that fact object of U.S. foreign policy and of the global U.S. military presence is to be the global hegemon, the sole legitimate source of military power in the world, defending many people, including our allies, many of whom are liberal from illiberal regimes or from illiberal challengers internally. And this posture doesn't look like that of empires past, uh, illiberal empires like Spain or Rome, but rather it looks, we are told, more like a liberal empire. The leading advocate for this is Neil Ferguson, who says that we, the United States today, behave much as Great Britain did in the 19th century. The logic being that because the United States is a liberal country domestically, that it serves as a liberal hegemon globally, promoting liberty globally. But I'm a bit skeptical of this thesis for a couple reasons. First of all, libertarians believe that government is, they believe in self-government and political accountability. We also believe in a government whose powers are limited. I happen to think it should be limited by a constitution, but there are other ways to limit the power of the state. And not, therefore, subject to the whims of uh, chance and personality uh, of whether or not the sovereign of the particular leader, a uh, particular leading country is liberal and behaving that way. So while I think that the American empire, if you wish to call it that, and it's liberal, I think, in practice, and I tend to believe that it is that in practice, but no empire, not even a liberal one, is consistent with a genuinely liberal principle that a state's powers cannot be unconstrained. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton taught us. And again, just power derived solely from the consent of the government. So I ask you, who among you cast a vote in the U.S. elections? Perhaps a few of you did, but most of you did not. And in what other ways are you given a say in how the U.S. conducts its foreign policy and how it deploys its military? Now, the defenders of the current system claim that there is de facto consent in which American hegemony has been allowed to grow and expand. Call it an empire if you wish, but it's an empire by invitation. And the absence of any serious challengers to this order implies the consent of the governed. The trouble is that even if libertarians, liberals, could reconcile, I think, the inherent contradictions of a single nation possessing de facto global power and authority, this supposedly liberal order does not work as well as its advocates claim in advancing peace and security. For one thing, the explicit object of U.S. foreign policy, since the end of the Cold War at least, has been to discourage our allies in Europe and in East Asia in particular from spending more on defense and to allow them to focus their attentions elsewhere. And they have. U.S. allies consistently spend less on their militaries, both as a share of GDP and in per capita terms, than do countries not sheltered under the American security umbrella, although it's hard to define where the limits of that umbrella actually lie. Because, let's recall, even those countries in Europe that are not explicitly members of NATO and therefore not 
not technically party to the Article 5 provision in NATO, can still free ride on the relatively secure environment created by American security guarantees. I don't think I have to go into the numbers on a per capita basis. On a, you oftentimes hear in the United States military spending expressed as a share of GDP. It's about 5% count the cost of the war. Of course, it's close to two, about just over two here in the UK. But on a per capita basis, the average American spends about $2,700 a year on national security, broadly defined. Uh, the average Brit about $1,000. The average German about $550. And the average Japanese about $340. So that's the real disparity that I think is worth dwelling on for a minute. Um, not surprisingly, this has caught the attention of some in the United States, and that is starting to become a subject of, conf of discussion, shall we say, in terms of the future direction of U.S. foreign policy, a talk that I, that I gave yesterday at IEA. Um, and we can address that in Q&A if you want. I'm going I'm to stick to a different script today. Um, there are other ways to defend the current system. Uh, another argument is it's just based on purely pragmatic grounds. The United States has such an enormous comparative advantage in providing these services, that is, the, pub, pub, the global public good of military security, of physical security, and that these inherent advantages for the United States are so, are so much greater when you consider that the inevitable inefficiencies of many, many different countries providing for their own security would include, obviously, a certain amount of waste and duplication across the system. So that may be an argument. And yet, on the other hand, a liberal would have to contend with the reality that most, nearly all, really, of America's allies do not choose to leave in the private economy those resources that they would otherwise dedicate to defense. Instead, they spend that money on other dubious projects, projects that are completely inconsistent with libertarian concepts of limited government and enumerated powers, and of a government that is uh, instituted to defend the lives and liberty of its citizens. There are still other reasons why libertarians should be skeptical of an activist, perhaps even aggressive, foreign policy. Uh, and this is not just by the United States, but this is by other genu generally liberal states. Uh, and here I'm speaking both of the UK and the US. Should we retain a traditional classical liberal presumption against war, against the use of force? Or is that advice for a bygone era? Well, I think we should. One of the reasons why is, for one thing, we have this deep and abiding skepticism about the government's ability to affect good ends, no matter how well-intentioned they are. And these doubts are informed, of course, by F.A. Hayek's observations of the fatal conceit, the erroneous belief that man is able to shape the world according to his wishes. Now, although Hayek said fairly, relatively little about foreign policy in his career, uh, Christopher Coyne and Rachel Mathers wrote an interesting article that applied Hayek's theory to foreign intervention and concluded that these will also tend to fail for all of the reasons that Hayek would have predicted, one of the most important of which is the problem of imperfect knowledge. Of course, Hayek said in the domestic economy, the government is incapable over the long term of regulating the economy because it, because it can't possibly know or reliably predict all of the things that it needs to know that the market understands intuitively. And the knowledge problem also contributes to unintended consequences. Now, these can be quite serious in the domestic context, but I submit that unintended consequences are more serious still in foreign affairs, foreign policy. This is obvious when one recalls the rather banal point that wars aim to kill people and break things. Even well-intentioned wars, and there are such things, those, for example, that are designed to remove a tyrant from power and liberate an oppressed people, they unleash chaos and violence that cannot be limited solely to those who are deserving of punishment. And repression and stifling of human rights and liberty often occurs even in the aftermath of what we would define as successful wars. So I think there's still reason to be skeptical of war as an engine for progress. <coughs> for all of these reasons, 
The expansion of state power, the problem of imperfect knowledge, the law of unintended consequences. I think that libertarians do and should treat war for what it is, a necessary evil. We believe the obviously good end of securing and advancing human liberty should, whenever possible, be achieved by peaceful ends. But while there is this long-standing tradition in libertarian thought, that intellectual tradition does not tell us what kinds of foreign policies are appropriate in all circumstances, including those foreign policies short of war. Is it even true that classical liberals from the 18th, 19th, or early 20th century should inform the conduct of foreign policy in the 21st? Well, I think so. Um, let me suggest, again, using the case that I know best, that a libertarian foreign policy for the United States today would resemble the one that Americans had at the founding of the Republic. It's an approach, I think, that would also be suited well to other countries striving toward liberalism. George Washington explained this ideal foreign policy in his farewell address, quote, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible. Washington and others in the American founding generation harbored a deeply ambivalent view of military power and war, and they believed especially that standing armies and endangerment of liberty went hand in hand. Washington advised his countrymen, for example, quote, to avoid the necessity of those overgrown military establishments which under any form of government are inauspicious to liberty and which are to be regarded as particularly hostile to Republican liberty. Now, when I was writing these remarks and revising them, it occurred to me that what looks like an overgrown military establishment to the United States might not look like one to the UK, and I think that would be a fair observation. The United States will spend this year over $700 billion on the US military alone, that is the base defense budget and the cost of the wars, and when you include the cost of other national security uh, uh, things like the Department of Homeland Security and other, uh, the number approaches one trillion dollars in national security spending in one year. But back to the founders. Because this philosophy that they had, this ambivalent view of war and the military, uh, came up against this bitter reality, which was that they realized that their ability to prevail militarily against our cousins, the British, during the revolution, had been instrumental to securing their liberty. On the other hand, of course, the presence of British troops in their midst was one of the particulars that, George, that Thomas Jefferson cited in the Declaration of Independence for wanting to be free of the mother country in the first place. So, the American Constitution resolved this tension between the necessity for a military for self-defense and the fear that a large military, a too large military, would undermine the delicate balance between the citizen and the state by strictly limiting the likelihood that the new nation would choose to become involved in foreign wars. Now, such sentiments strike many today as unnecessarily unwieldy and perhaps even dangerous. The world is simply too dangerous, they say. The President of the United States or any other leader of a modern nation state must have the power to initiate war quickly, at a moment's notice even, and ask permission after the fact. And there were no doubt some in the late 18th century who believed much the same thing. But by fortunate circumstance, as much as by design, uh, for much of the first 150 or so years of American history, Americans were rather successful at staying out of foreign wars, and therefore had very little need for a large military. That's not to say that there weren't wars fought from time to time. Nearly every generation in the United States, every generation of Americans, had some experience in war. Of course, the most uh, uh, costly war in American history was the war between the states, the Civil War. But in each case, ambition and optimism about the likelihood of quick success was eventually replaced with humility and pessimism and an appreciation, most importantly, of the costs and the possibility of failure. And once these lessons sunk in, Americans generally return to the philosophy espoused by the founders, that free nations possess small professional militaries and strive to avoid foreign wars, even as they are happy to profit from foreign trade and to otherwise serve as an example to the world. This model persisted even as the United States became involved in far larger wars in distant lands in the first half of the 20th century, 
Attitudes began to change in the years after World War II, uh, and a new model took root that endures in the United States to this day and globally. When the Cold War ended, political pressure and bureaucratic inertia kept military spending much higher than necessity dictated. It did come down, but it still remained higher than it was prior to World War II. And whereas Americans had once armed for war and then returned to peaceful pursuits when the wars ended, they now armed for the sake of arming. Meanwhile, policymakers in Washington searched around for new places to use that power. And the process, they suddenly changed the definition of common defense as expressed in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and I think if you go back to when this whole process started, I think during the early days of the Cold War, this was defensible. And it is defensible even in retrospect. Forward positioning U.S. troops to deter an attack by our common enemy, the Soviet Union, and later Communist China, and working with our allies to defeat a communist advance if deterrence failed, was consistent with a narrow conception of U.S. national interests and self-defense. Many libertarians supported this policy during the Cold War in practice, even though they occasionally quarreled with its implementation in particular places. But a truly libertarian foreign policy would have revisited the rationales put forward for collective defense in the Cold War period, in the post-Cold War period, that is. Instead, following the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States adopted an expanded version of common defense. The U.S. government pledged to defend not merely the vital economic and population centers of Western Europe and East Asia, but also a host of emerging countries and regions, including in Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, and Southwest Asia, the Persian Gulf. The object was to discourage countries from taking steps to defend themselves, in part because such steps might lead to destabilizing arms races, and in part because some Americans feared the creation of independent centers of power that might someday challenge U.S. dominance and perhaps ultimately threaten U.S. security. Well, I submit that was a mistake. And it's one that Americans can correct if we were to refocus our attention and revisit our definition of common defense and collective defense. And I think it would be not merely good for the United States, but also good for the cause of limited government and individual liberty, and therefore ultimately good for the whole world. Indeed, I think limiting the U.S. government's propensity to intervene militarily or otherwise engage in a very activist foreign policy, and limiting its propensity to intervene in part by limiting its ability to intervene by cutting military spending, what I call in my book Solving the Power Problem. I think those steps may be essential over the long term to preserving liberty for all. Because if the U.S. military's budget were to shrink, this would compel Washington to prioritize, and it would force it to better align its strategic ends with available means. Such a shift might also induce a greater sense of self-reliance and empowerment among U.S. allies who have sheltered for decades under the American security umbrella. And if you consider the kinds of threats that we deal with here in the early 21st century, terrorism is an ongoing concern, but it pales in comparison to the types of wars fought in the first half of the 20th century. More to the point, military intervention is usually irrelevant when dealing with non-state actors such as Al-Qaeda, and in many cases, it's actually worse than irrelevant. It's counterproductive. There may be other occasions when military force is required to eliminate an urgent threat to national security, and we must maintain a strong military to deal with such threats. But we do not need a hyperactive interventionist foreign policy in order to preserve security. Such a policy is inconsistent with our basic ideas about the proper role of government. Because the preservation of our physical security and our uh, way of life, collectively all of us, depends on our participation in the international system, we must regain, remain engaged in the world. But we do not need to send our troops to foreign lands and fight other people's wars to rebuild and rebuild other people's countries to do those things. And contrary to Neil Ferguson's claims, the international system exists in spite of, not because of, the power of any one state. And it's the height of folly presume that the world will descend into chaos if the United States shapes its military to advance its vital national interests and adopts a more discriminating approach to the use of force. Now, 
Are there other reasons still why libertarians might support uh, a, a U.S. government that was behaving as it has over the last 50 or 60 years as a global hegemon? Um, today, many people not living in the United States, including I suspect some people here today, argue that the cause of individual liberty and human rights needs a champion and that the United States is and should be that champion. People living under a tyrant's heel deserve to be liberated. The power of the U.S. military might convince petty despots to step down, and failing that, the sharp end of American military power might deliver them to a prison or to the gallows. But liberty has many champions. They include institutions like my own, Cato Institute, the Atlas Foundation, the Adam Smith Institute, the Institute of Economic Affairs, where I spoke yesterday, and there are countless other libertarian and classical liberal organizations operating around the world today that promote the cause of limited government, individual liberty, and free markets every day. And there are, frankly, millions of people, tens of millions of people, who advance the cause of liberty in the same way, and that's as it should be. Just as libertarians don't want a single entity to deliver the mail, send electrical power to our houses, and provide internet connections to our computers, it is better that liberty has many champions. These champions for liberty do not perform their work at the behest of any government. They do not operate under the covering fire of American armaments or anyone else's armaments. And they have succeeded spectacularly well. We live in a more liberal world today than the one of my youth, and I'm not that. They do their work voluntarily, and they promote their ideas peacefully. And that is the essence of libertarianism and of a libertarian foreign policy. A world that was less dependent upon the use of military power would be a safer one, but also a more liberal one. So let me close. Please don't get me wrong. I know this is a tough sell. It's a tough sell in the United States. It's a tougher sell here, I suspect. If the United States were to reduce military spending, shed overseas commitments, and reorient its foreign policies chiefly to self-defense, it might threaten liberal interest. It might. For example, such a shift would allow and perhaps even encourage other governments to spend more on their individual militaries. And they might do that by extracting additional resources from the private sector or raising taxes. This would not be a victory for liberalism. I am well aware of it. On the other hand, Though the American security umbrella was opened up over our allies precisely to, precisely to allow them to avoid many of the costs of self-defense, as I've noted, these governments have used the security guarantee as a cover for expanding the state's authority into areas that are not core functions of limited government. It is equally plausible, therefore, that a reduction in U.S. military spending will force governments to refocus on their core obligations to their citizens, to their constituents, and the net result will be better security and more liberty for all. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay, 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 thank you. Okay, we've got time for questions. Who wants to uh, lead us off? Don't be shy, I'm used to, uh, you know, Okay, right up at the back. Uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, you spoke about America using NATO and so on, and the fact that Europe has done quite well under the Pax Americana. My question to you is, do you think there should be some defense and cooperation between states to reduce costs so will be in the taxation and so on? And my second question would be, um, does it surprise you, maybe shock you, what's happened over Libya that Congress was not asked, the, the anti-war movement <coughs> and the Democrats used to dissipate when Barack Obama became president? Does that shock you? Does that maybe I'll answer the second question first. No, it does not shock me. Uh, partisanship is a, is a very powerful thing. Um, there were a few principled anti-war Democrats, as there were some principled anti-war Republicans who were not opposing President Obama purely for political purposes, as liberal Democrats accused the conservative Republicans of doing. I also tend to think that there was a credible constitutional case to be made that the war in Libya was at a minimum a, uh, uh, an abuse of presidential power. So there is, there is that. Uh, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, it worries me, though, because th this is the power problem that I talk about in my book. 
When the U.S. military has the ability to act anywhere in the world at a moment's notice with no prior preparation, which it does, then it is inevitable that people will ask it to act, ask the U.S. president to act. It requires an extraordinary amount of discipline by that president to say no, but occasionally that's what he must say. Um, it did not help, I suspect, that, his, that President Obama's uh, UN Secretary, uh, UN Ambassador Susan Rice, years ago wrote, used the fact that the United States had intervened in the Balkans and had not done so in Darfur, in Sudan, and implied very thinly that this must be an expression of American racism. Okay? That's the challenge for a country like the United States, when our interventions at a minimum appear to be inconsistent. You need to explain that inconsistency. And it seems to me that a better way to enforce some discipline is to have some tangible connection to U.S. national security. That's a, what a concept. As far as defense co cooperation goes, two points. Uh, first of all, I think that NATO, um, that, that the real problem that I have with NATO is the Article 5 guarantee. I would not object to a NATO uh, continuing as an organization to facilitate cooperation between the United States and Canada and the countries of, of Europe. And I think that at a minimum that will happen. And I don't think that the, that the end of the Article 5 guarantee is, is nigh. Okay? I think that's still quite strong, you know, despite my best efforts. But I also think that to the extent that European defense cooperation outside of NATO has not lived up to people's expectations, some people's expectations, I think is explained by the existence of NATO. And it's explained by the posture that successive US governments have taken to suggestions that there be an independent European military capability that is independent of NATO. And this is a bipartisan conceit on the part of American leaders. Going back to George H.W. Bush at the end of the Cold War, we're very disdainful and, and strongly discouraged the creation of an independent security uh, capacity under the EU. And I think that was a mistake, I think it was short-sighted, and I think there are still opportunities for facilitating that greater cooperation among the EU states, even as I'm not a great fan, per se, of the EU as an institution. Thank you. Uh, uh, you, you no, no, well, you, whatever. I, I'll, I'll I think he was first there, okay, and all right. then, then we'll go back. So. All right, thanks. I need that help. So you go, okay, and then I'll, 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 Go ahead. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Sure. Uh, I've, I have two questions, I think they are two at least, there might be a sub question to that. Is it the case that the reason why the US has kept on with its large military spending in the Pax Americana is that we still sort of, the US institutions have not gotten over the Cold War yet? I mean, it's been <laughs> the hangover from 1989. Yes. yes. And, the other, uh, and the other question is, how much I mean, if you look back on history, you can see one of the most successful things that America did during the Cold War was its culture. It exported its culture. Yes. I mean, Billy Graham in Berlin, basically, right. uh, in West Berlin, was showing the was showing Soviets that we are winning and we're your free Europe. Right. Uh, and today, I mean, face, I mean Facebook is right. an American invention. Right. So as long as, uh, I, would you agree with, as long as the US has its innovative powers in terms of culture, Right. People will buy the products, and the U.S. will be will still be quite powerful country. Yeah, I mean that that second question is the easiest one to answer. Is I think it is it is difficult in the extreme to argue that Facebook's success or Google's success or Microsoft's success or I could go down the list um, is in any way contingent upon U.S. military dominance, not military power. Because again, I expect the United States will be very powerful militarily. We'll have the strongest military in the world. I expect that to happen. But there is a fine line between sufficient defense capability and overwhelming defense capability. And I think it is, it is very, very hard to make the case uh, that the appeal of American products and innovation and culture, again, you know, is George, is George Clooney popular in, in Europe because, uh, you know, because of the U.S. military? I tend to doubt it. 
Is George Clooney still popular in the earth? Or is it Justin Bieber or something? I, I, um, so I struggle with that a little bit. As far as US institutions, yes, of course. Institutions behave institutionally. They are slow moving and they create uh, interests that, that uh, are hard to break up. You know, uh, th this year is, uh, you know, 19, 19, uh, 1961, uh, two great speeches were given in the span of about four days from one another. One, of course, was John Kennedy's inaugural address, but the other one, four days earlier, was Dwight David Eisenhower's military industrial complex speech. Farewell address, known as the military industrial complex speech. We had a couple events at Cato to mark the 50th anniversary of that speech. And what's remarkable is that Eisenhower did not uh, deny that a powerful military, a very powerful military, was needed to fight the Soviet Union. That he, he understood and he accepted it. But he accepted it with great reluctance. And his message in that speech was to not lose sight of the fact that we are investing time and resources and attention and effort into a particular undertaking to defeat the Soviet Empire. Um, that over time, will bleed talent and resources and attention away from the private sector and create institutions that will hold on to that power even if the threat abates. So I think that what would have disappointed Eisenhower the most but also not, but not surprised him was the persistence of that complex, loosely defined, of interests that simply didn't exist uh, in, in his lifetime in the United States, a, a group of interests organized around military power, providing for the military, uh, and, I, and I think, he, again, he would have been deeply disappointed by that, but not uh, so surprised. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again for a great talk. Um, a very interesting one. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, libertarianism in foreign policy versus democracy and in international diplomacy. Uh, with reference to an understanding that security and spending is no, no longer just for military hardware, it's for energy provision, it's for um, well, food provision as well. Uh, regarding, say, the uh, involvement of the US in the Middle East, some may say that they got involved to secure energy provision. And domestically, with regards to the domestic audience in the United States, how would the administration, how would uh, the uh, concept of libertarianism be applied to try and unwheel, unwind, I should say, uh, the amounts of money and amounts of resources spent at home, um, with reference to an economist article, the US Department of Defense is the highest employer right. in the world. Right. Um, how, my second part of the question is, how would it be sold at home Right. Two very good questions. Um, let me deal with the second one first. I, I think that uh, U.S. military spending has come down from time to time. In, uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, the U.S. did reduce military spending quite dramatically. The, the size of the active duty military was shrunk, uh, and, and spending came down. And there were some dislocations. In fact, I think an, an excellent PhD dissertation could be written on why uh, the defense drawdown cost George H.W. Bush the 1992 election, for example. Uh, but the, the end result is there was consolidation in the defense industry such that um, fewer people today are employed in that industry than 20 years ago or 40 years ago when I wrote my dissertation about a similar incident at the end of the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, so at the end of the day, it is not economic interests that are driving our foreign policies. Everyone, you know, whenever someone wants to cut a weapon system or close a base, the interests that are tightly connected to that enterprise will rise up. But there's a sense on the part of the 98.7% or 99.7% of the people who are not, who do not tangibly benefit from that. Uh, there is a sense that that thing is providing them some other good, security, broadly defined. 
and therefore they're willing to tolerate it. And again, many on the right are quite supportive of military spending, and I like to call them situational Keynesians, okay, because they think that they, they, they really like uh, military spending uh, as opposed to any other kind of spending. The problem is that because U.S. foreign policy is dedicated so much to other people's security, okay, to a much broader vision than that kind of core common defense, uh, that if the American public understood that, they would turn very sharply against it. And, and, I, and, and I believe that to be true, but most importantly, one of my, one of my harshest critics and, and someone who is a great defender of our, our current U.S. foreign policy, Michael Mandelbaum, wrote in his book, The Case for Goliath, he said, the American role in the world depends in large me measure upon the American public not scrutinizing it too closely. I mean, he wrote that. It was shockingly mean, remarkably candid, I thought, and, and, and true. Well, I submit that it's not wise to expect a country to persist in a policy and hoping that the people remain forever ignorant of what that policy is actually intended to do. As for the question about energy, I spend a lot of time on this in my book because I believe very strongly that the arguments made to defend U.S. access to raw materials globally and that the U.S. military presence provides that first and foremost for us because we are the primary consumer of those resources, the largest economy, and that the side effect benefits to everyone else are, are just that, just a side effect. Everyone else gets the benefit. Yes, there's free riding. Who cares, in effect? Okay? It's, all, it's all still to the good. Um, and I believe that if I could prove my case uh, that that does not apply in the case of oil and natural gas in particular from the Persian Gulf, then it would apply to every other resource in the world. And here's the thing. The United States, American consumers, consumers here in Europe and elsewhere, have alternatives when the price of oil goes up. They can uh, if, it, if the oil, if, if the price is caused by a supply shock, they can acquire it from other places because the market remains quite dynamic, even the energy market, which has its own idiosyncrasies. But we can also, sub we have other substitution effects. Let me tell you that when I first started working at Cato, I live a ridiculous far distance from, uh, from where I work, and I drove for the first six months or so. And then the price of gasoline went from $2 to $4 a gallon, and I now ride a bus and I have ever since. So we can change our behavior and we can adapt. And it does not, it is not ruinous to our economy. If you had told someone that the price of energy in the United States would literally double in the space of a year and a half or so, which is what happened in 2005, 2006, they would have told you that it would have absolutely destroyed the economy. It did not. It was painful. There were some effects, but it did not destroy us. On the other hand, the supplying countries have no alternative other than what they can suck out of the ground. A few of the wiser ones are trying to capitalize on that, knowing that it is a finite resource ultimately. But they must get their products to market, or they have nothing. And I think when I hear people in the United States or elsewhere talk about energy dependence, it is one of the most maddening concepts I can imagine. Because we are not dependent upon their providing us with energy. They are. So I can't give that. That is an, ex, that is an important question. And it's, there's much more to it than I can answer here. Um, I'd encourage you to look at what I say in the book. I go into much more detail uh, about why that particular argument to me is one of the least convincing. And yet also one of the most pernicious because it drives a lot of people who I think have otherwise quite sensible ideas about U.S. foreign policy to say the way to solve our foreign policy is to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. It's absurd. Thank you. Okay, so now I've lost track. I think, uh, ma'am, you have your, your hand up. Then I'll give you, sir. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask you specifically about Israel and U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel? Um, U.S. has been the, the power, the current power, right, um, in the Middle East, right, vis-a-vis -vis Israel. 
and an argument has been made that Israel has now grown up and they could be able to, to look after themselves. Right. So how would your argument about withdrawing the U.S. Right. current work in that particular scenario? Well, th this I understand this is a this is a difficult question and a complicated question, but in my mind it's a fairly simple one. First of all, we do not have a formal treaty security relationship with the Israelis, which we do with all European members of NATO, which we do under the Rio Pact with most of the countries of Central and South America, which we do with the East Asian countries with bilateral treaties, etc., etc., etc. So what we have instead is a particular kind of relationship that has, and the most important uh, aspect of that has been considerable sums of U.S. foreign direct assistance to the Israelis, uh, much of which goes to their military. I think roughly 20% of, of the Israeli military budget is basically provided by the United States. So, it shouldn't shock you, I think, that someone who is skeptical of direct foreign assistance from the United States to any other country is not a fan of that, but I would make the same argument for U.S. assistance to Egypt or any other country in the region, Pakistan, I could go down the list. I just don't think it is consistent with our, our notions of limited government and what's, what works. Okay. But as for Israeli security, they have nuclear weapons, which is one of the worst kept secrets on the planet, right? And so their ability to defend themselves, it seems to me, is not contingent upon U.S. security guarantees. And most importantly, they should not believe that either. I think it was Golda Meir who many, many years ago warned about the Israelis believing themselves dependent upon any foreign power. It wasn't at the time the United States, but now it clearly is. And I think it's just extraordinarily short-sighted. And to the extent that it is true, they should wish not to be heavily dependent upon and so I think the, the message that I have for many countries does apply equally to, is, to Israel. And I think in some respects, they are, in spite of, they are in a more dangerous environment. And the situation has certainly gotten more tenuous because of the, the Arab awakening and, and some of the uh, pressures on the governments that have traditionally been willing to cooperate with the Israelis. I don't doubt they're feeling more nervous today than they were a year ago. Uh, and yet, their ability to defend themselves, I think, is still quite strong, especially respect, irrespective of what the United States does. Does that answer your question? Sure. Yes, ma'am. I, I, you've been very patient. Yes. You focus particularly on NATO, but the main center of U.S. strategic anxiety, if you like, is shifting to the Pacific. Yes. And from your libertarian perspective, how would you like to see American aspirations in that region limited, and how would you define U.S. interests? Sure. Thank, thank you for that question. The talk that I gave yesterday, one of the uh, uh, people in the audience very politely mentioned that I didn't say anything about China. <laughs> she said that after I had finished speaking, and I admitted, I realized that was a huge oversight, and there I did it again. Um, Part of, part of the reason is because I'm told that whenever U.S. officials come to Europe and they say, what about China, the response from the European officials is, what about China? Uh, we, being a both Atlantic country and a Pacific country, uh, are, I think, understandably more concerned about China for, and from a security perspective. Obviously, it's incredibly important as a, an economy uh, for the Europeans. Yes, uh, attention is shifting from Europe to East Asia. And uh, more emphasis, I think, will be placed on U U.S. security uh, relationships with the countries in East Asia, even ex perhaps expanding those relationships. But I, I worry that that is a bit short-sighted because uh, to the extent that China's rising economic power is, or, or at least could be, uh, a military concern, a military challenge, strategic challenge to the United States and to the region, it would be better for there to be countries on China's periphery that were capable and empowered to defend themselves. In other words, my argument is quite different for Europe because I see the security environment in Europe being quite benign and I don't believe that European countries would have to uh, exert themselves heroically in order to make up 
for you what what was lost from a U.S. withdrawal from Europe, for example. Um, on the other hand, I do think that some of the countries in Asia will have to get serious about uh, defending themselves, and I don't think that is a bad thing. I think what is worse is the assumption that the United States will always be there to help them, backstop them, uh, and I, I think that's a problem. I think it's short sighted. I've written a bit about this. I wrote a paper several years ago on the U.S.-Japan security relationship. I think a similar argument applies to South Korea or to Vietnam or to Australia, other countries in the region. Um, and meanwhile, there's India, which is, uh, which is growing and does not face the kind of demographic crunch that the Chinese are going to face because of the ironic success of their one-child policy. Um, so, uh, while the security situation is more tenuous, I think, in Asia, there are alternatives to, to American military power there as well, if American officials were willing to cultivate them. Chris, there's just one here in the front row. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, I was <laughs> kind of... <laughs> yes, sir, yes. So thanks, thanks very much sure. for, for, for your very thoughtful remarks. And as you point out, we've grown up under an American military umbrella, and that's provided um, the liberal moment of the post-war period, yes. including the liberal economic and trade institutions which have made for global prosperity. Yes. And of course these institutions, as we speak, are under unprecedented strain right. at the moment. Right. And I suppose I'm asking myself if your remarks really are taking place at the most timely moment. <laughs> Um, if this is really a good time for the United right. States to be stepping back from its international responsibilities, if that's giving a helpful signal to the rest of the world, which is undergoing strain, including institutional strain. Right. And I say that mindful of the fact that some of us in the room will have sufficiently long memories to cast our minds back to the interwar period right. during which American disengagement wasn't altogether helpful to the right. international community. A good question. Um, we are under strain too in the United States. Not to the same degree and not for the same reasons. Okay? But when, when the United States started the unipolar project, so if you want to date that from the end of the Cold War, for example, the United States accounted for about a third of global economic output and about a third of global military spending. Okay? Today, the United States accounts for nearly half of global military spending and less than a quarter of economic output. And those trends are likely to continue. So the, the question I would put back to you is, if there will never be a good time to develop, to, there will never be a good time to make a transition so the better solution is to develop an alternative that we can transition to gradually. The problem is the United States has been so reluctant to contemplate what that alternative would look like that there will never be a good time. And yet, we will wake up sometime in the future and U.S. global share of military spending will be, I don't know, 70% of the world total, because everyone else will continue to draw down, because why else would they need military power? Because they have the U.S. security umbrella. And our share of economic output will go down, because other countries are getting richer. And where, and then what? We are left, we left ourselves with no credible alternative. And what I'm trying to set out is a credible alternative, not one that we're going to achieve overnight but one that we need to be driving towards, where countries are slightly less dependent upon U.S. military power and more empowered to defend themselves and to act to defend their interests in their, especially in their respective regions of the world. Um, I understand that's not an entirely satisfactory answer, and I understand that things have been quite good. And, and again, I want to emphasize, you know, I. I'm a historian of the Cold War, and, and had I been, and I feel as though I understand quite well the decisions that American presidents, going back to Harry Truman, made 
in the immediate post-war period, and I believe in retrospect they were the right ones. Where I fault American officials, and to a certain, mainly American officials, is that they never revisited those assumptions that were based on allies who were broken and broke. And eventually those allies became repaired and wealthy. And now, of course, EU economic output outstrips the United States collectively. So somewhere along the line, we missed an opportunity to make a transition. And I'm trying to find that moment. And you may be right. This particular moment may not be right. I'll note that I wrote my book before the collapse of the residential housing market in the United States and the collapse of a number of banks and the collapse of several large economies here in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there may never be a good time, but I worry that we will be left in the future with an even worse situation where the United States, and then, and then the transition will be even less pleasant because it will be more dramatic. And the United States and the American public will be, will turn harshly against a kind of global engagement that I am a great believer in. So. Thank you. Yeah, uh, okay, so you and then you. And uh, yeah, we'll try and get everybody here. We have time, right? Yes, go. Yes, I'm going to try and be quick. It's uh, frightening to hear a libertarian saying nice things about the EU. Um, <laughs> I, I take it all back. That's <laughs> okay then. But it is, after all, a new model of post democratic institutions, not a federation of independent yes, states. Thank you. And uh, the only pragmatic uh, argument for having a European army is to be unable to wage war anywhere <laughs> in any form. <laughs> But it would still cost us a stupendous amount of money, which yes. is not much good yes. for the libertarian. I wonder, uh, this after all, mandarinate a post-democratic organization, uh, what value there could be either to the United States or to Europeans in having an EU. So let me clarify my remarks. Um, I believe that a, Euro a, a European security institution that was uh, comprised of sovereign states cooperating with one another to advance common interests would be a good thing. And you were NATO? Perhaps, yes. Because, yes. And so in other words, it does not depend upon a strong EU. It does not depend upon the institutions of the EU. It depends upon the extent to which the member states in that alliance see the benefits of collective defense and collective security. And so far, they have not seen those benefits given the vast disparity between what the United States and what, they, what we spend and what we provide and what they spend and what they can provide. Again, I don't blame our allies for behaving as they have. You know, we have been, there has been a 2% of GDP requirement under NATO for as long as anyone can remember. And what, four out of 27 countries meet it? And thank you very much. I understand the British one of them. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. The average is 1.74% or something like that. Um, those, those kind of, that outcome should be predicted by our understanding of free riding behavior and the problem of public goods. In fact, was predicted by Manker Olson, among others, who defined the problem of public goods. We, the United States, are providing something that should be provided by others under normal circumstances. And again, when we started this process, I think it made sense. But it is making less sense over time as our comparative advantages abate. That's basically what I'm arguing. Yes, sir. Um, one of the things you mentioned, uh, this sort of follow-up on the EU army. Um, what, I did not call for an EU army. Well, well or, or a joint <laughs> yes. defense thing. Um, I did a bit of sort of local work in Massachusetts trying to set up regionalization of services and stuff. Okay. And one of the problems is that towns, when one town raised taxes but the other tax levy failed, they would get angry and in one case sued each other over it. What I can't figure out to do in terms of this cooperation is the, co the problem you seem to currently have is a collect is collective. I don't see how this doesn't eventually lead to giving taxation powers to the EU in terms of calling for a joint European defense. Because I see inevitably you having problems and people presenting the solution to these problems as either being able to enforce 
the, the, the agreed upon payments or turning it into a direct system of taxation. And I don't see how that's sort of a good thing, especially given the democratic deficit there. Right. So, uh, and so you solve, typically we solve collective action problems, whether it's, you know, unionization or taxation for the provision of public services by uh, compelling people to pay, right, and, and punishing free ride behavior. Um, I'm not a fan of that either. But the question is, the current system also has its flaws in which U.S. taxpayers are compelled to pay for a system that they understood and still many believe, to be primarily for them, for their collective defense. And so it's kind of, you know, choose the, work, choose, choose the better of the bad cases that we have available to us, right? And I think that, you know, the U.S. model has been quite effective in the past, but it is becoming harder to sustain as the circumstances around the world are changing so so I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not going to say here on the record that I'm in favor of the EU having taxing power, okay, because I think that would be a mistake. Um, but again, the individual member states could do that. The individual member states have militaries, will continue to have their own militaries, and they have taxes to provide for the common defense of their constituents. So why could it not continue uh, as a, a as a collection of sovereign states, where the, where the taxing power is held by the, by the individual governments, not by a collective. It could be worked out. It would be tricky, I'll admit. It could be worked out. I got a quick sense of how many questions there are remaining in everyone who's got them. So, really. Okay, three. Well, let, this is going to be fine. Then. So I, won't, I won't say anything more about the EU. And if I say <laughs> that, I apologize in advance. Uh, let's just, uh, you've been very patient in the back, and I, I see you, sir. I'll get you. Yes, sir. Right, right there, yes, are you? Yes, I went to a lecture last week given by somebody I'd never expect to agree with on anything, uh, Professor Rogers, who is uh, um, heads of the Department of Peace Studies at the University of Bradford. Okay. And he advanced the theory that uh, dating back from the failure of Soviet involvement in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda hatched a plan to, that was deliberately designed to provoke the US into acting extremely aggressively and to draw the US military into a lot of uh, Middle Eastern and Central Asian countries with the idea of assisting to bankrupt and ultimately break up the United States. Right. What are your ideas on that? Um, it is true that uh, bin Laden made several remarks to the, ex to the effect that his strategy was to uh, lead the United States into bankruptcy. One of my favorite lines from one of his uh, many rants was, all we have to do is raise a flag on which is written Al-Qaeda, and they will race there, they will send their generals there to deal with it. And I think there's a certain element of that reactive mode of US foreign policy of the last 10 years that seems to play into Al-Qaeda's game plan to the extent that it was. But I don't want to give them too much credit. Because after all, Osama bin Laden is at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. I believe that to be true. Many Al Qaeda senior officials have been killed or captured, and the organization is badly broken. Not gone, but badly broken. So if that was their plan, they have failed, and they will fail. Because while the United States can occasionally do stupid things, um, you're not going to bleed us into bankruptcy by causing us to do these things. However, the other, another title of my book, another book that I wrote, called Terrorizing Ourselves, we look at terrorism beyond Al-Qaeda and the object of many terrorist campaigns, not just Al-Qaeda's campaign, is to induce on the part of a target government an overreaction that undermines its authority at home, and threatens the lives of others abroad, which drives them into the hands of the terrorist organization. And so part of wise counterterrorism is not overreacting. 
Now again, how do you define what is an overreaction and what is a prudent response gets interesting. But let me just submit that uh, to the extent that that was Al-Qaeda's goal, it was not a particularly innovative or unique one. Okay. Um, but it's, it, so I, I wouldn't give them too much credit, uh, and, and I think that it, to the extent they believed it to be true, uh, they were badly mistaken. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for your remarks, and very thought-provoking indeed. I, I'm struggling with trying to work out whether this is a libertarian view or a pragmatic American view. <laughs> Uh, I completely understand that if you subsidize goods, others will want more of them. Yes. And you've been subsidizing the defense all around the world from America for some time. Yes. By the way, we've got 20,000 troops in Germany. Yes. And nobody knows why. I and understand they're coming out. Just well, they may be. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. The of you, you watch for the, for the, for the arguments yeah. that will emerge to keep them there. Yeah. But, but I completely understand the, the, the argument that it's not fair. There's no particular American interest. Uh, that's absolutely overwhelming that demands this continued subsidy of the rest of the world's defense. Right. What I don't see is the connection between that and an argument which says that makes war less likely in the world and therefore stabilizes our okay. defense uh, and, and advances the libertarian cause. Right. Um, good question. Um, yes, it's true. I am both an American and a libertarian, and therefore an American libertarian. Uh, and 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 I and I've given this talk to different audiences at different times where I put the emphasis on different things. But at the end of the day, I believe that the the system of government that was created in the United States at the founding was one of the most libertarian systems of government in human history, and that if we had adhered to those founders' intentions with respect to the use of force, we would have continued to be, and we still are, of course, an example to the world, right? We set our house in order, we don't make promises we, don't, we can't keep, and we inspire people to emulate us, right? That's how we behaved as a country for many, many years, right? So what I'm trying to do is, is just, is, to my fellow Americans especially, is to remind them of this tradition. To my non-American friends, I say, to the extent that that is true, that the United States is still the leading liberal slash libertarian nation in the world, it does not serve the interests of liberalism for us to become less liberal and to become more statist. Okay? That's, what, that's the most important. The last question is about war. Okay. Would a country, would a world with a slightly less dominant US military be more war prone? If I believe that, I wouldn't argue the case that I'm making, because I do believe that war is the greatest threat to liberty, both as well as our lives. But I believe that having empowered nations responsible for their own defense is ultimately better and more likely to prove an effective deterrent to war than the current model, which says the United States is the de facto deterrent power for nearly every country in the world. You see what I'm saying? The ability to sustain the credibility of that deterrent power attenuates over time. And I think what we've seen is the United States must behave in a more and more aggressive and kind of promiscuous way to bolster the credibility of that deterrent. And eventually it's going to become impossible to sustain that. Right? So that's, that's my answer to you. And I, I understand that it may not be entirely satisfactory. But. Okay, uh, time for uh, two more and we'll get them both. Yes, yes, sir. And then, and then yes. Uh, Naomi Klein has a view shared by men of the left that. Uh, Western I'm sorry, Naomi Klein? Klein? Yeah. Okay. Oh boy. Um, wow, where's this going? Shared by many on the left that Western foreign policy has been designed to advance neoliberalism to democratic countries in the third world and elsewhere that don't really want uh, free markets. Uh, what do you make of this claim? It is, it, is, it is outrageously, absurdly wrong. It yeah. is based on a completely inaccurate reading of liberalism, of libertarianism. Um, most shockingly, 
in, I have not read this, her book, but my most shocking is her implication of Milton Friedman in this enterprise, okay? Because Milton Friedman was opposed to the Iraq War. Milton Friedman was opposed to the Bush Doctrine. Milton Friedman opposed the use of force in the way that George Bush used it. And so for her to use him as the kind of keystone for her argument is it reveals her ignorance, frankly, or her mendacity because either she believes, she understands it to be true, and she's just lying. Um, I, I can't do justice to the, thoroughly refuting that thesis, uh, other than to point to my colleague, uh, sort of colleague, um, uh, Johan Norberg, thank you, uh, who responded to this thesis in great detail. Uh, if you go to the Cato website, you can find that essay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, you focused in your talk uh, mostly on the security dimension yes. of uh, foreign policy. Um, in a libertarian foreign policy, does trade warrant a uh, foreign policy uh, treatment or not? And if so, uh, what role do you see? Yes, I, I said this at the outset, but I didn't put enough emphasis on it. So let me say unequivocally that a libertarian foreign policy is dedicated to the principles of free trade. And um, I sometimes joke that if I were to die and be reincarnated, I would not come back as a foreign policy analyst per se, I would come back as a trade policy analyst. Because I believe so strongly that that is the true engine of liberty and economic progress. Uh, but where it has become confused uh, is the belief that trade can only flourish under the cover of an American military dominance or some other hegemonic presence, Great Britain in the 19th century. Uh, that argument is made. I believe it to be not particularly compelling. In fact, this is, goes to the argument we heard earlier about if you look at the way that trade has actually uh, expanded over these years, you cannot <coughs> connect it to U.S. military power. If anything, U.S. military power has been a distraction or an impediment to trade. And so I would, I would leave very, very few exceptions to my kind of ideal free trade regime, even very few exceptions on, on ostensibly national security grounds, that is, you know, the, the, the trade of sensitive technologies or things like that, which as a practical matter are usually just rent-seeking behavior by companies that are trying to prevent them trying to fend off competitors. Um, so, no, I, I, I want to, this is a good way to close, okay? Because uh, peace and trade are the essential elements of a libertarian foreign policy. And I think we, we do a disservice to both of those when we believe that they can only flourish when there's war or when there is the the, 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 the danger or the threat of war. And I think, in fact, that it's closer to true. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Well, thank you to Chris. Thank you all for coming. We've uh, ticked our trade box. Now we just need to have our peace box. We need someone to talk about the tolerable administration of justice. There we go. <laughs> yeah, Chris, thank you. That was great. Cheers. <clears throat> okay, who are you studying with there?